O God, whose never-failing providence ordereth all things, both in heaven and earth, we humbly beseech thee to put away from us all hurtful things, and give us those things which be profitable for us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hymn 629, 19th century hymn on the Holy Scripture. O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, send us increase from above, enlarge, expand all living souls to comprehend your love, and make us all go on to know with nobler powers conferred. The Lord has yet light and truth to break from his word. We return here. We're picking up with uh, Kyle and Delich on First and Second Kings. Um, let's see which uh, this is attributed to both of them. I think First and Second Samuel. Kyle did, but we'll see. So both of the men are involved in this. Um, the edition I have is 1978. Let's see under their dates. It's translated from the German. So we're in the book of Kings. Pick up where we left off. Whereas under the idolatrous and godly rulers, they offered the power of God, such energetic resistance to idolatry and everything evil and ungodly that the princes and people are compelled to bow before them and succumb to their divine words. In this way, the prophets accompanied the monarchy in all of its course, from Solomon to the captivity as the guardians of the rights of the God King and as interpreters of his counsel and will. And that was brought up with the emergence of Samuel in the pre-monarchial period with hints that this function went on before Samuel, but he, uh, Kyle and Delich give it a greater visibility with Samuel coming in to the period of Saul and David and living long enough to anoint David, but in a twofold function to speak truth to the king in the prophetic institution and to speak judgment as well. And I think this raises the canonical issue for us of the canon and the law and the history serves, certainly, <laughs> David and Solomon's time. We think of the prophet Nathan who chastises David for his manifold wickedness of murder, first degree murder and adultery, which is theft and defamation of God's word, thinking he could defame God's word and take it in a light and irreverent manner. But let's press on. The first Kings, <coughs> Samuel brings us through the period of Saul and David. <coughs> Kings is the transition to Solomon. Under Solomon, indeed, there was apparently a long period during which prophecy fell into the background. So he says, since the Lord himself not only appeared to this king in a dream at Gibeon shortly after he ascended the throne, but also appeared to him a second time after the dedication of the temple, I promised him the fulfillment of his prayers and the glorification and eternal continuance of the kingdom on condition of his faithful observance of the divine commands. Towards the end of his reign, he rose up again in all the more threatening attitude against the king who was then disposed to fall away from Jehovah. It was no doubt a prophet who announced to him the separation of ten parts of his kingdom, possibly the same Ahijah who promised Jeroboam, the government over ten tribes. But after the division of the kingdom, when Jeroboam proceeded in order to fortify his throne, to make the political division into a field religious one, and to 
to this end exalted the image worship into the state religion. The prophets continued to denounce this apostasy and proclaimed to the sinful kings the destruction of their dynasties. And when at a still later date, Ahab, the son of Omri, and his wife Jezebel endeavored to make Phoenician worship of Baal and Asherah into the national religion in Israel, Elijah, the Tishbite, the prophet as fire, whose words burn as a torch. <laughs> and they're beautiful came forward with the irresistible power of God. Nice word from a Lutheran. And maintained a victorious conflict against the prophets and servants of Baal, warding off the utter apostasy of the nation by uniting the prophets into societies. Well, well, well. Theological liberals and how Elijah organize the academy, academies, and Elisha. And they travel around to some of the theological schools in which the worship of God was maintained and the godly in Israel were supplied with a substitute for that legal worship in the temple, which was enjoyed by the godly in Judah. And in the kingdom of Judah also, there was never wanting prophets to announce the judgments of the Lord to the idolatrous kings and to afford a vigorous support to the pious and God-fearing rulers in their endeavors to promote the religious life of the nation and to exalt the public worship of God in the temple. Saints, the kingdom of Judah possessed the true sanctuary with the legal worship and an influential body of priests since moreover the monarchy of the house of David was firmly established by divine promises resting upon that house and among the kings who sat upon the throne from Rehoboam onwards there were many godly rulers who were distinguished for their lofty virtues as governors the labors of the prophets did not assume the same importance here as they did in the kingdom of the ten tribes where they had to fight against idolatry from the beginning to the end. Uh, we could put J. Grish and Machen in the school of the prophets. And I have never contemplated this aspect of the prophetic institution in this direction, which should have certainly uh, in the New Testament gifts of prophecy that one function is to oppose incorrupt, corrupt rulers and to strengthen the godly. Not all this babble of the Pentecostal Montanists. We don't study anything. And so we're discovering even here as we read this, a new angle that we can bring over here into contemporary theology and practical theology. I think needs greater visibility. Thank you, professors Kyle and Delich, for this. They fought against idolatry. Think of Professor J. Gresham H. and my great grandfather, theologically, fought against the idolatry of the inquisitors. That's term inquisitor is Robert Dick Wilson another great grandfather in the Old Testament lineage whence this scribe comes to oppose doctrinal errors. Elijah, inside the church. And it's John the Baptist's function as the great prophet as well. And he does his ministry. He loses his head. This explains the fact that the ministry of the prophets assumes such a prominent position in the book of Kings, whereas the history of Kings appears sometimes to fall back in the background in comparison. Nevertheless, the historical development of the monarchy, to express it more correctly, 
of the kingdom of God under the kings forms the true subject of matter of our books. It was not a prophetical didactic purpose, but the prophetical historical point of view. I'm not sure the binary uh, several separation there is necessary by the professor of what's going on, which prevailed throughout the whole work and determined the reception as well as the treatment of historical matters. The progressive development of the kingdom was predicted and described by the Lord himself in the promise communicated to David by the prophet Nathan. And we believe some of Nathan's writings were involved. He was a writer. Scholars are. Prophets were. Ezra and Nehemiah, people of the books. And they conserve, they fight back, they fight bad doctrine, and they think, they read, they mark, they learn, they inwardly digest, they pray. And they speak to the heresies and errors of their time. And when the day, quote, and when thy days shall be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build his house for my name. <clears throat> you can see how the title Son of David is picked up in the New Testament for our sovereign redeemer, our sovereign king, David, the true David, as it were. I will be his father. He shall be my son. That if he go astray, I may chasten him with man's rod. Of course, Jesus doesn't go astray. That's why he's the perfect David. And with stripes of the children of men, but my mercy will not depart from him. As I caused it to depart from Saul, when I put away before thee, and thy house and thy kingdom shall be established before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Second Samuel 7, a potent book. This thoroughly glorious promise forms the red thread and by the way, it's raining and lightning here, and I just noticed a flicker on the lights, so if we disappear, <laughs> we're at the tail end of the hurricane here. It's, they're predicting five, six days of rain. I got the grass cut, so. And, and I got the three grandkids running around on the inside. I couldn't be happier as a granddad. My three grandkids here on one day, two of the three are being homeschooled by the mothers at Christian Academy, the little one, a little infant, Scotland, seven months old. I just had a good time with them. God, may they rise in God's fear, walking his faith. This thoroughly glorious promise forms the red thread which runs through the history of the kings from Solomon to the Babylonian captivity. We want to sharpen up the dates on Solomon talking about a good 400 years and constitutes the leading idea in the record of this history in our books. The author's intention is to show in the history how the kings, how the Lord fulfilled his gracious word. And here the liberals have got to be just choking. The Lord fulfilled his word. God fulfills prophecies. That can't happen. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Peter Hurds, he's a pretty well-trained guy, he's a historian, just mentioned today to me that the higher criticism was viewed by the founder of the Jewish Theological Seminary here in the United States. He called it the higher anti-Semitism, Semitic criticism. Uh, it's an interesting chart because it's German liberalism. And we're going to want to ply and plumb that. Robert Dick Wilson calls the German liberals inquisitors. And here, Kylan Delich talks about the Lord fulfilling his promise. I don't like that language. I think I have to deal with the sovereign God. 
how he first chastised the seed of David for its transgression and then cast it off, though not forever. And we might say and add that we're in the prophetic tradition in this sense, that we correct the bad theologians. We try to, and they're out there. To this end, he shows in the history of Solomon how, notwithstanding the usurpation of the throne attempted by Adonijah, Solomon received the support of his father's kingdom as the seed of David, promised by the Lord and established by his power. How the Lord, at the very beginning of his reign, renewed to him at Gibeon the promise made to his father on condition of his faithful observance in the law and in answer to his prayer that, that he would be wise and understanding. But God also gave him riches and honor so that his equal was not to be found among all the kings of the earth. First Kings 1 through 5. And that's a, a statement we want to examine later, the extent to which Solomon's reputation extended Think about the extent to which his geography went. How rich was he? Certainly going to get the centrality of the temple in Solomon's mind, which is the centrality of the gospel. And the God who comes as the sovereign Holy One in all of his infinite majesty and glory and meets the tiny little human being bringing his burnt offering and the tiny little high priest taking and sprinkling the blood around and on the inside and here and there. And on the Ark of the Covenant, tiny little priests, tiny little humans needing forgiveness and redemption and God meets them and brings mercy. We'll see the centrality of the temple. King Solomon was central for David, but God said, no, you can't build it, you're a man of blood give it to your son to do. That's going to emerge here in these opening chapters of First and Second Kings. It tells us how Solomon then carried out the work of building the temple entrusted to him by his father according to the will of God and how after it was finished, the Lord assured him again of the fulfillment of the prophet of promise. So really... You've got promise and prophecy going on, prediction. Can God do that? Liberals don't think so. Those who are belonging to the Holy Catholic, Apostolic, Protestant, Reformed Church certainly do. And so do the, these Holy Catholic, Apostolic, Lutheran believers here. And I would think historic Catholic scholarship too, but that's a little bit beyond our we get so many books to read in so little time. And lastly, it'd be fun to talk to the Pope about this. Um, Francis, he's so busy with administrative stuff, though. Yeah. He's not doing any scholarly work anymore, I, I don't think. Solomon, having attained to the highest earthly glory, though the completion of the rest of his buildings through the great renown of his wisdom, we we're reading ecclesiastical Ecclesiastes as we speak. Uh, yeah, and morning and evening prayer. We'll finish it for five days. And then, of course, the book of Proverbs. <coughs> He's known to have written a thousand Proverbs. He had a literary guild around him, a man of literature books as well, like Ezra and Nehemiah. And lastly, how Solomon, having attained to the highest of earthly glory, he's going to fall too later in life. We'll get to that. And then the kingdom's going to be split. You don't mess with God. And Solomon did later in life. The renown of his wisdom, which had reached to nations afar off and through his great riches, acquired partly by marine commerce and trade, um, down at Elat, I've been there. Um, I lived in Israel for a while, uh, just before, who is an interlude in my undergraduate days. I, mean, I was able to travel down there. 
That's where Solomon had his, you know, you've got the V, Red Sea, Egypt, and then up here, Red Sea, right up at the tip. This is below the Sea of uh, Dead Sea, hot, barren down there. But he had a, a port down there. My understanding is Solomon ran ships out as far as Persia, Iraq, India, all up and through there. And, uh, all kinds of stuff got. And they, they did sailing. This is nothing surprising. In 1000 BC, 950 BC, nothing surprising at all. Um, and partly from tributes and presents, he forgot his God who bestowed his glory upon him. This is a warning to every old guy like me following God. The same with King Uzziah. He was blessed in life of following the Lord. And then he got, he got a big head, Uzziah. This is later after Solomon. He thinks he can go and do what he wants to in terms of the worship of God. And Eighty priests find King Uzziah in the temple. What was he doing? Was he sprinkling blood? He was doing something that was a, the province of the priests. And he showed his disrespect for God's canon. God's book of Leviticus. God zapped him with leprosy on the forehead. And he had to be separated, live in quarantine until his death. Solomon, after these tremendous blessings, gets uh, what a harem of a thousand wives contracted from marital and political gain. I don't know if it was sexual so much. But what these foreign wives did was bring in disrespect for God's canon, God's covenant, God's word that began corrupting the court. Now that problem is going to continue in terms of intermarriage all the way down through Ezra and Nehemiah and see. And even in the post-exilic period, centuries later, there's always the corruption of God's children by marrying an unbeliever. Someone who brings up children not in the fear of God, but they begin to imitate mom, or imitate dad. Instead of being raised in the fear and godly reverence of God. Anyways, back to Solomon here. And partly, okay, he forgets God in his old age. So if you're an old guy listening to this, take heed, be warned. This old guy, think about this all day for a day or two led astray into unfaithfulness towards the Lord through his numerous foreign wives and had at last to listen to this sentence from God through a prophet. Because thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear, rend is the word, <clears throat> take away rend the kingdom from you and give it to thy servant. This is a national disaster and turning point in Israel's history. The Solomonic disobedience. God allowed it. When God allows something, it's because it's foreordained now. We can plumb and ply the questions related to that. He could have stopped Solomon. He could have interceded. Just like he could have interceded in stopping Hitler, but didn't allow him to rise up and kill six million Jews. See what the problems we have as classicists? Can't answer it. The ongoing slaughter of infants in abortion centers. We beg for God to stop it. We beg for young people to listen to us and to raise up the political shackles, you know, make some noise. This is murder. 
God's wheels of justice grind slowly, but they grind. And when they grind, there's nothing stopping. It's kind of like the seventh, uh, uh, late seventh, sixth century BC. Manasseh, he repented at the end of his life, another king. But he'd done so much junk for 50 years before that. His late life repentance, he'd already set in, in force forces that uh, permitted these sins. So as classicists, we have some, some unanswered questions and challenges. Anyways, we, what we do read is Solomon goofed up. And he's getting the kingdom torn out of his hands, ten tribes out of twelve. And give it to thy servant, notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it. For David, thy father's sake, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Albeit I will not rend away all your kingdom, but will give one tribe to your son David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Thus, because God had promised to the seed of David, the eternal possession of the throne, Second Samuel 7. One portion of the kingdom was left to his son, to the son of Solomon, with the chosen city of Jerusalem, and to his servant, Jerob Jeroboam, was only to obtain the dominion of the ten tribes. The historical realization of this prophecy is shown in the history the two divided kingdoms. I think right there we learn again the prophecy comes to pass. And the writer and compiler of first and second kings views God as implementing his judgment on his chosen nation. In the synchronistic account of these kingdoms, now we're going to be talking about the history of Israel, split off ten tribes in the history, the southern tribe of Judah, Jerusalem, the king of, kings of Judah, kings of Israel. This was an unstable breed up in the north, and it was more stable and godly in the south. But it, too, by the time it will be conquered by the Babylonians, that's a, beyond right now where we're at. According to the principle already adopted in the book of Genesis of disposing of in of subordinate lines of patriarchs before proceeding with the main line. Oh my, there's a interesting philosophy in history. We got the true church with crummy branches. He cuts off crummy branches. He cuts off the house of Ishmael. Genesis. He cuts off the house of Esau. Jacob have I loved and Esau I have hated. He chooses Isaac over Ishmael. And so likewise he's cutting off the ten tribes. The subordinate line of patriarchs before proceeding with the man. That's what we view as happened with the Romanist church. Tremendous history. It is our history as true Catholics, not Roman Catholics, true Catholics, Protestants. But they continue to embrace, still do, the false gospel. God's good. God has cut them off. Oh, yes, there's many devout people in Rome, Romanism, as there was devout people in the northern kingdom of Elijah and Elisha. That does not mean that at the top it's not corrupt. And so Rome has been cut off. Theologically, Council of Trent, they've never repented of that. It's a fake gospel. Lots of other stuff around it. But you get inside the bowels of that theological argument. We're doing systematics in church history here with Old Testament. You can't, you gotta have all the disciplines going. Uh, and I'd say the same with the mainline Protestant tradition today. Uh, God's in the process of pruning, cutting that off. Despite having a lot of endowments, money, 
National Cathedral. You will hear the gospel up there. They'll call it the gospel. A lot of pretty music, great architecture. Anyways, I digress, but here's an important line. You see God pruning the old covenant line and getting rid of the, the bad branches. And Jesus said that, I am the vine. If you don't if you don't bear fruit, you get cut off. Jesus, God is the one who tends to the plants. I've got rose bushes out here. My daughter's always at me, Dad, you gotta trim back some of those crummy branches so we get out the snippers. She kind of follows, tells me what to do, and telling me and teaching me, you know, if you got to cut this off, this will go over here. And kind of like a scientific discussion we have about trimming, pruning our rose bushes. Same, same idea here going on. The divided kingdom. Like we said, it's a major turning point in Israel. The reigns of the kings of Israel are here described before those of the contemporaneous kings of Judah. And, uh, you hear the thunder out here. And to some extent, in a more elaborate manner. The reason of this, however, is that the history of the kingdom of Israel, in which one dynasty overthrew another, whilst all the rulers walked in the sin of Jeroboam and Ahab, even added the worship of Baal, to that said, supplied the author with more materials for the execution of his plan than the kingdom of Judah, which had a much quieter development under the rule of the house of David, in which, therefore, there was less to relate. Interesting. Apart from all of this, all the events of the kingdom of Judah, which are of any importance in relation to the progress of the kingdom of God, are just as elaborately described as those connected with the kingdom of Israel. And the author does uh, equal justice to both kingdoms, showing how the Lord manifested himself equally to both and bore with them with divine long-suffering and grace. But the proof of this necessarily assumed different forms according to the different attitudes which they assumed towards the Lord. Jeroboam, the founder of the kingdom of Israel to the north, when told that he would be king over the ten tribes, had received the promise that Jehovah would be with him to build him a lasting house as he built for David and give Israel to him on condition that he would walk in the ways of the Lord. 1 Kings 11, this implied that his descendants would rule over Israel or the ten tribes so long as this kingdom should stand. Of course, he doesn't do that. For it was not to last forever, but the separation would come to an end. Therefore, he is not promised the everlasting continuance of his kingdom. But Jeroboam did not fulfill this condition, nor did any of the rulers of Israel who succeeded him. The history of the northern kingdoms is a disaster. Elijah has to do battle up north. Never the Lord, nevertheless, the Lord had patience with the kings and tribes who were unfaithful to his law, and not only warned them continually by his prophets, and chastised them by threats of punishment, by the fulfillment of those threats upon the king and all the people. Let me see here where we're at. <clears throat> Until the time of grace had expired, when this sinful kingdom fell, and the ten tribes were carried away to Media and Assyria. In the kingdom of David, on the contrary, the succession to the throne was promised to the house of David for all time. Now, this will create some tensions in the post-exilic period, and yet they will maintain this faith that a true David, the eternal Messiah, would come of the house of David born in the city of Bethlehem. 
we read of how Herod in Matthew 2 uh, hears about this birth of these magi. And he calls his theologians together and says, where's the Messiah to be born? And they tell him, in Bethlehem. And he then puts out the hit piece to kill all the children in Bethlehem because he's thinking this David, Davidic king has been born. He's half a believer, half a non-believer. And the corrupt side of him kills children instead of accepting Jesus as his Messiah. He's on the side of the devil in that. Anyways, that shows how the Davidic promises survived the Babylonian exile and the post-exilic period down to, through the Maccabean period, the Alexandrian period, and it's existed right into the period of the incarnation of Jesus. Therefore, although the Lord caused those who were rebellious to be chastised by hostile nations, yet for his servant David's sake, he left a light, a beautiful verse to that effect, I have left a light in the royal house, since he did not punish the kings who were addicted to idolatry with extermination of their family. First Kings 15, Second Kings 8. And even when wicked Athaliah destroyed all the royal seed, he caused Joash, the infant son of Ahaziah, to be saved and raised to the throne of his fathers. Consequently, this kingdom was able to survive that of the ten tribes for an entire period, just because it possessed a firm political basis in an uninterrupted succession of the Davidic house, as it was possessed, it possessed a spiritual basis of no less firmness in the temple, which the Lord had sanctified as the place where his name would be revealed. All of this we see God's almighty graciousness in keeping his people in the line of the promises made to Adam and Eve in Genesis 13, kept alive through the Noahic period when the church had shrunk to eight people, kept alive in the Exodus, and Sinai, period of the judges, and so forth, all the way down to Solomon. After it had been brought to the verge of destruction by the godless Ahaz, it received then a king, Hezekiah, a king who did what was right in the eyes of Jehovah as his father. Well, not his father, but this is like 200 years, 250 years. They called him his father, David. But Hezekiah is what, roughly 740 to 690-ish B.C.? And Isaiah is one of the great court prophets who teaches Hezekiah. He makes a couple goof-ups, too. But his heart is in the right place, and in the severe oppression which he suffered at the hands of the powerful army of the proud Sennacherib, he took refuge in the Lord who protected and saved Jerusalem. He was a pious king of Jerusalem. But when at length, throughout the long reign of Manasseh, this would be his uh, son, King Manasseh, the idolater, apostasy and moral corruption prevailed to such an extent in Judah, in the south, that even the pious Josiah, this would be 622 BC, with the Reformation of religion, which he carried out with the greatest of zeal, which was basically a rediscovery of the potency of the biblical faith and instituted reforms, could only put, could only put down the outward worship of, of idols and was unable to affect any thorough conversion of the people. And the Lord, as the Holy One of Israel, was obliged to declare his purpose of rejecting Judah from before his face on account of the sins of Manasseh. 
and to cause that purpose to be executed by Nebuchadnezzar, 2 Kings 23 and 24. And the church is shaken to its core. Shaken, whittled down, pruned, chastened, driven off into exile. Bitter, another bitter experience this now for the South. So if you ever fear that the church is being shaken in a wrong day, we can draw comfort from this. Even if there's eight, eight left standing, maybe we'd be one of the eight in Noah's time. Jehoiakim was led away captive to Babylon and under Zedekiah. The kingdom was destroyed with the burning of Jerusalem and the temple. Yet the Lord did not suffer the light there's the word, to be put out altogether as promised to his servant David. And when Jehoiakim, this is what, 609, 605, 600 BC, had pined in captivity in Babylon for 37 years, expiating his own and his father's son sins, I wouldn't use that term. He was liberated from his captivity by Nebuchadnezzar's son and raised to honor once more. The account of this joyful change in the condition of King Jehoiakim, southern Judean king, with which the books of the kings close form so essential part of the author's plan that without this information, the true conclusion of his work would be altogether wanting. For this event shed upon the dark night of the captivity, the first gray of a better future, that very, very nicely said, kept hope alive in the dark ages of the exile, which was to dawn upon the seed of David and with it upon the whole nation in its eventual redemption from Babylon and was also a pledge of the certain fulfillment of the promise that the Lord would not forever withdraw his faith, his favor from the seed of David. Now there's a footnote here, let's see what's going on. Stalin is the name of a, it's spelled like Stalin, Joseph Stalin, but S-T-A-H-E-L-I-N, makes the following remark. The book of the kings form an antithesis to the history of David, as the latter shows how obedience to God and to the utterances of his prom, prom, promises is rewarded, and how even when jo Jehovah is obliged to punish, he makes known his grace in answer to repentance. So do the book of the kings, which we're studying first and second kings, which relate to the overthrow of both Hebrew states, teach through the history of these two kingdoms how glorious promises are thrown back and dynasties fall in consequence of the conduct of individual men. And still more with second kings. The sins of one man like Manasseh are sufficient to neutralize all the promises that have been given to the house of David. There's no need to refute this erroneous statement, since it only rests upon a misinterpretation of 2 Kings 21 and completely misses the idea which runs through both books of Kings. And moreover, there's no contradiction between the manifestation of divine mercy towards penitent sinners and the punishment of men according to their deeds. Thus, we're carrying on. He had a little uh, fight there with that st st Helen, Stalin. Thus the book of Kings bring down to the history of the Old Testament kingdom of God according to the divine plan of the kingdom indicated in 2 Samuel 7 from the close of David's reign to the captivity. And the fact that in 1 Kings 1-1 they are formally attached to the books of Samuel 
is an indication that they are the continuation of those books. And that will have some implications for the canon question. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that they formed from the very first a separate work, The Independence and Internal Unity of which are apparent from the uniformity of the treatment of the history, as well as from the unity of the language. I can hear the libos coming along with that one and just chomp away. From beginning to end, the author quotes from original sources, most part withstanding certain formulas. In all important events, he gives the chronology carefully gives a bunch of references. He judges the conduct throughout according to the standard of law of Moses. A lot of references. That is huge. The authority of the canon in judging kings. Can we say sola scriptura? Can we say where Jesus got his view of the canon? Shot and tittle inspiration. Hello, Libos. And nearly always employs the same expressions when describing the commencement, the character and close of each reign, as well as the death and burial of the king with more references. For characteristics of several kings of Judah, a whole bunch of references. And so again, the language of the books remains uniform in every part of the work if we accept certain variations occasioned by the differences in the sources employed, since we find throughout isolated expressions and forms of a later name and words traceable to the Assyrian and Chaldean epoch, such as Kor and Ho Mer, a bunch of references, and many others which do not occur in the earlier historical books. The books of the king distinguished from the books of Samuel throughout these character, through these characteristic peculiarities, but not so much through the quotations which are so prominent in the historical narrative. For these are common to all historical books of the Old Testament and are only more conspicuous in these books, especially in the history of the kings of the two kingdoms because in the case of all the kings, even those in relation to whom there was nothing to record of any importance to the kingdom of God except the length and general characteristics of their reign, there are notices of the writings which contain further information concerning their reigns. The unity of authorship is generally admitted since as Devet himself acknowledges you cannot anywhere detect the interpolation and composition or combination of different accounts. That is an explosive remark. Explosive. Why? Because of the deviant dissectionists. Now, my term, the term of Dr. Gleason Archer, they try that game all over Old Testament studies. Dissect the frame and here and this guy, this guy, that guy. And you, by the time you're done, you don't know who wrote the book. And it's full of so many errors. Now who can trust it? Devet says no. Kylan Delich, unity of authorship, my word. I don't know, maybe go get my PhD in Old Testament, all of my the bulk of my own personal work is done in church history and systematics. Uh, we'll see. Too old. And I got plenty more books to read. The direct and indirect contradictions, however, which Thenius imagines, imagines that he discovered, proved to be utterly polite, fallacious. I'm not sure who this Thenius is. On closer inspection of the passages, cited as proofs could only be obtained through misinterpretations occasioned by erroneous assumptions. See, on the other hand, Lebrook, their eight in Das Alten Testament. 
all that can be determined with certainty in relation to the origin of the Book of Kings is that they were composed in the second half of the Babylonian captivity, 560 BC, and yet before its close, 538 with the Ed 539 with the Edict of Cyrus, since they bring the history down to that time and yet contain no illusion. Well, this is a good point to the deliverances of the people out of Babylon. The author was a prophet living in the Babylonian exile, though not the prophet Jeremiah, as the earlier theologians down to Havernick have assumed from the notice in the Talmud, Baba Bothra, Jeremias scripts at Librum Surum at Librum Regum at Thranos. I wonder why, why could it not be Jeremiah? He's uh, kind of devilish saying no. The report is Jeremiah was carted off to Egypt. For even apart from the fact that Jeremiah ended his days in Egypt, he could hardly have survived the last event recorded in our books, namely the liberation of Jehoiakim from prison and his exaltation to royal honors by evil Merodach. For inasmuch as this event occurred 66 years after his call to be a prophet, which was normally at age 30, in the 13th year of Josiah, he would have been 86 years old. In the 37th year, a joy akin had been carried into exile. Even if he had commenced his prophetic career with only a young man of 20. Okay, we're into a quibble here. And let's not forget the scholars that were produced under these men. But why not? It's, it, I'm, I hesitate to dispute with the Talmud. Uh, even if he had reached this great age, he would surely not have composed our books at a later period still. Moreover, all that has been adduced in support of this is seen to be inconclusive on closer inspection. The similarity in the linguistic character of our books, that of the writings of Jeremiah, the somber view of history, which is common to the two, the preference apparent in both for phrases taken from the Pentateuch, that's potent, and the allusions to earlier prophecies. All these peculiarities may be explained so far as they really exist, partly from the fact that they were written in the same age, since all the writers at the time of the captivity and afterwards cling very closely to the Pentateuch. Yeah, they've been disciplined to do that. And the prophets and the scholars. And in the book, it's always the intellectuals who defend the church. And it's also the intellectuals who can injure the church. And frequently refer to the law of Moses, and partly from the circumstance that while Jeremiah was well acquainted with the original source of our books, that's important, namely the annals of the kingdom of Judah, the author of our books were also well acquainted with the prophecies of Jeremiah. But the relation between 2 Kings and Jeremiah 52 is not of such a nature that these two accounts of the destruction of Jerusalem and the carrying away of the remnant of the people could have emanated from the hands of Jeremiah. On the contrary, closer inspection clearly shows that they are extracts from a more elaborate description of this catastrophe. This may be a good time to bring this to a close.
This is delightful stuff. Why? Because it's the operation of God's hands in which we delight. Well, we're, we've got, oh, we've got a 20th century hymn on scripture. So we're on the alert, hymn 630. Let's see, verse 1, 630. Thanks to God whose word was spoken in the deed that made the earth. Is the voice that called a nation. Is the fires that tried her worth. God has spoken. Praise God for his open word. Let us pray. Blessing and honor, and glory and power, and to him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Until next time, God speed.